Hey, welcome to another weekend message. I'm Pastor Bill Thomas. I'm out at Hereford Faith and Life Church out in Moncton, Maryland. If you're in our neck of the woods, come and join one of our two worship services uh, each Sunday. Nine o'clock is our contemporary service with a worship team. Uh, we have Sunday school and nursery at that time for the kiddos. And then uh, there's a King's Cafe in between there. We get some nice uh, treats and coffee. Uh, then at 11 o'clock, we have our traditional service over in our sanctuary with choir, liturgy, other works. So you get to choose a contemporary, traditional, or both really nice services, and we'd love to have you. Uh, but chances are, if you're watching this, it means that you, know, you are either traveling or away. Maybe you're homebound. Maybe uh, maybe you don't even live in our ministry area. But I'll tell you what, I'm really, really happy that you're part of this church family, happy that you're Investing this time and in growing uh, in Christ and his word, and as we, especially in this uh, second week of Advent, as we are preparing our hearts to celebrate the real meaning of Christmas in this world that's gone bonkers. So let's open up in prayer, and uh, I've got a message that I think that will be helpful to you, so make sure I have your Bible and a place to take notes. Heavenly Father, we give you our lives today as living sacrifices. We thank you for all your blessings Father, I pray that anyone uh, uh, watching that have needs, Lord, that you would touch them, whether it be healing or financial or uh, emotional needs. Maybe just uh, someone needs a, a dose of encouragement. Uh, they're discouraged. Maybe they're anxious or depressed. Lord, come and be a light in their life. Just come and lift them out of that pit and set their feet on solid ground. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, whose birth we're going to celebrate in a couple of weeks here. And thank you for his finished work on the cross for us, that we might rest in him. For we thank you, Holy Spirit, come, uh, be our teacher, and may we be fertile soil. Lord, plow our hearts so the seed of your word will find uh, a good place to take root and grow and produce much fruit in our lives and in the life of those around us, the kingdom around us. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Well, uh, let's get right into it because uh, I really believe that uh, there's a lot of us who are uh, waiting and uh, and waiting is tough. I, I mean, really, l let's just ask a question. Uh, how many of you enjoy waiting? I mean, really, I mean, uh, does anybody like to wait in a line? I uh, do you like to wait for your food? You know, uh, it wasn't that long ago, uh, my family, I took them to McDonald's and we were in such a hurry. You know, we thought we'd eat on the run. Uh, uh, after we paid for our order, we pulled up to where usually they give you the food and they said, could you pull up over there? One of those waiting uh, uh, parking spaces and we'll, we'll come get you when the food's ready. We'll come bring it out to you. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is fast food. If I wanted to sit in a restaurant, I would have done that. But I know waiting's no fun, you know, if it was, uh, people be enjoying their trip to the DMV when that's time to renew your license or do something down there. It's, it's just, a, it's a long wait. No one likes to wait. In fact, you know, we have whole industries uh, to keep us from waiting. Like I said fast food, but uh, I think of urgent care. Do you remember what a novel idea, man? You don't have to go to emergency room. You have to go wait for your doctor's point. Just go and step in and open clinics. Now you find them everywhere. Uh, no one wants to wait. But you know what? Uh, God almost always has us experience times of waiting, seasons of waiting. Uh, uh, I've seen and heard instantaneous answers to prayer um, it might be healing for somebody or deliverance but i really think most of the time those are rare uh, most of the time god has us waiting on him uh, waiting to see our dreams unfold waiting to uh, experience answered prayer waiting for god just to show up and you know, uh, if you're with me last week, we we touched base on a couple in the Bible, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, and how they were ready to partner with God in being a uh, uh, part of that first uh, Christmas when Jesus came. And uh, let me just refresh your memory. There were descendants uh, in a priestly line to serve the temple. Zacharias was a priest, and Luke records in his first chapter, verse 6, that Zachariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all the Lord's commands and regulations. So, you know, they're good people. 
They, they were godly people. They, they were loving God, loving people around them, serving. But they had an ache in their heart because throughout their long marriage together, Luke tells us that they were childless. Elizabeth was unable to conceive all these decades of marriage, but no children. I want you to think about it. You know, uh, these are the kind of people you think uh, that if life was fair, they should have it all. I mean, they were good. They were righteous. They were godly. Life should have gone wonderful for them. But they didn't have what they really, really desperately wanted in their hearts. They wanted children. And I believe God puts this situation here in his word to remind us that life rarely turns out the way we want. Yeah, have you ever noticed that? The percentage of people who are in occupations they prepared for for college are far and few between marriage, family, vocation, economic status. Uh, it rarely turns out all that we dream. And it rarely turns out better than we planned. Many times it's less than we planned, but most of us wonder, you know, what happened to my life? In Jewish culture, the, to be barren was a curse from God. According to the Bible, it's God who opens and closes the womb. So Elizabeth's barrenness uh, was a source of disgrace for her, humiliation. Uh, you have this good, godly couple who are serving as priests to the people. Zachariah is preaching, and the crowd's probably staring at Elizabeth, talking quietly among themselves. I wonder, I wonder what deep, dark, terrible secret she hides. I wonder what really happens behind closed doors in their home since God has not given them a child. Now, some of you uh, watching, uh, you know the heartache of barrenness. Um, our firstborn and our lastborn, we have two adopted children after that, but our firstborn and our lastborn, uh, they just happened, right? They were wonderful, wonderful gifts from God, just totally blew us away. The four that came in between those two, though, well, they included long seasons of waiting, fertility clinics, medications, several miscarriages, stillbirths, so devastating and heart-wrenching. And unless you have personally been through that, you, you don't know. It's a special fraternity of those who wait and hope and wait and hope only to be hurt and wounded, wondering why us? We're good people. Why can't we have children like everyone else? Some of us also know the the heartache of the barrenness of soul, right? Life took a terrible turn. Well, today I want us to go deeper into these two amazing people because they teach us valuable lessons about waiting on God. I mean, we don't like to wait for anything or anybody. It's no wonder we don't like to wait on God to answer our prayers or to intervene in our lives. Waiting on God, just like waiting anytime, it's hard. It's tough. It, it, it can hurt. When you're waiting on God to deliver a loved one from addiction or to come back to Christ or to find faith, and you're waiting and you're 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 waiting and you're just, you know, the Bible says the Lord is the strength of my life. And yet you don't know that. Listen, until you have personally expended all your strength and all you have waiting on God. Waiting can become discouraging. It can bring what many writers call the dark night of the soul when you feel like God is so distant or God doesn't care. But good things happen also to those who wait on God. Lamentations chapter 326, it says, It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 40, 31, I love this verse. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's one of my life verses. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 4, you help those who wait on you. So God says it, it's good to wait on him. It makes us more Christ-like, right? It grows our character. It matures our spirit. It helps us grow in our faith. It teaches us perseverance and trusting God. Now, there's an important backdrop to the first Christmas that we often overlook or simply forget. And I want to highlight that as we go into this lesson about Zachariah and Elizabeth. And that's this. The Jewish people were in a 
uh, sorry, a 400 year waiting period from the last time God had spoke to them. It had been 400 years since God had spoken to his people through the prophet Malachi. 400 years. I mean, I've had the silent treatment for my wife every now and then, but not 400 years. God was silent. Listen, everything was put on hold. The weight was unbearable. Historically, the Jewish people always had God speaking to them through prophets, words of encouragement, words of guidance, words of direction, even words of correction. But for four centuries, the heaven was mute. The Jews were persecuted at this time. They were targets of assimilation in the Greek culture. They were oppressed. Pagan nations and rulers sought to destroy the Jewish religion. During the time of Zechariah and Elizabeth, Jerusalem was surrounded, and surrounded regions were under the heavy boot of the Roman Empire. And Jews had been dispersed into every region of the known world. Their faith had codified into a massive accumulation of laws and regulations administered by a professional priesthood. And people, that's what happens when God is silent. Faith deteriorates into religion. A dynamic relationship deteriorates into rules and regulations and traditions. That's why we always need fresh words and revelation from God, from his word. And that's a whole nother message, but just hear that. Now, Zachariah's division of the priesthood rotated with the other divisions. They would serve two weeks, twice a year, to minister in Solomon's temple, the temple of the Lord. And they numbered about 18,000. And they drew by lot one man out of that 18,000 to go into the holy place and burn incense before the Lord. Incense being the symbolic uh, reference to the prayers of God's people. It was, uh, so to speak, a lotto for God. So the winner was quite ecstatic. And Zechariah, in this record of Luke, he wins that lottery, which would have been probably the uh, highest moment of his professional and spiritual life. And while he's burning incense in the temple worship, in the holy place, Gabriel, the angel of the Lord, appears and speaks the first words of God, the first communication to his people in 400 years. And he tells Zechariah, your prayers have been heard. And you're going to have a child, a boy, and your son will be the forerunner of the Messiah. So he would prepare the people's hearts to receive Christ. So let, let's let's look at what we learn from Zachariah and Elizabeth and what we should do when we're waiting in the waiting zone of God. Here's the first thing we need to do. We learn this from Zachariah and Elizabeth. We need to release the power and discipline of persevering prayer. We need to persevere in prayer. Zachariah and Elizabeth never stopped praying. Luke records that Zachariah was in the temple ministering to the Lord according to all of his priestly rules and regulations. And he was praying, praying while he was ministering for decades, maybe half a century. They never stopped praying. I bet it blew Zachariah's mind when the angel said, God has heard your prayer. You know, oftentimes while we're waiting on God, the first thing we forget is that God hears every prayer that we pray. Every one of them. Far too many Christians, listen, get tired of waiting on God. One of the first things they throw out is prayer. They stop praying. They think to themselves, what's the use? God doesn't uh, know what he, we need. Surely he does. Why, why do I have to keep hounding him about this need? He knows I need it. He doesn't hear my prayers. We all battle those thoughts. But listen to Jesus teaches a parable in Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 5. Then teaching them, the disciples, more about prayer, he used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight wanting to borrow three loaves of bread, and you say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit, and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me. The door is locked for the night. My family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, He'll get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. <laughs> Knocking on that door, you get up. And Jesus then says, so I tell you, keep on asking 
and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, you'll find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. Everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Persevere in prayer. Don't stop praying. The second thing we learn from Zachariah and Elizabeth is that we're to release our dreams and expectations and exchange them for God's. See, the bottom line here is life is not about you or me. It's not about what we want, what we dream for. It, it, it's all about God. What does God want me to do? What does God desire for me? What's God's will and purposes for my life? Now, it says Zachariah was praying in the temple. What was he praying? I don't think he was praying about having a son. You know, little Zach Jr. They were far beyond the age. I'm confident Zachariah had given that dream to God long ago. I, I really think Zachariah was dreaming for something bigger than the coming of his son. I think he was praying for the coming of the Messiah, the Son of God. And that's the prayer God heard. I just believe that at some point, Zachary and Elizabeth said, you know what? It's time for us to stop praying for our own children and just give that dream to God. Let's put our heart's desire for kids in the hands of God. Let's not worry about it anymore. And they exchanged it for God's bigger dream and purpose to bring forth God's son, the long way to Messiah. And that became now the focal point of their prayer, not for their own son, but for the son of God. Now, God has a way of fulfilling his purposes in the earth, but also a way of fulfilling the deepest desires and needs of our heart. So Zachary and Elizabeth get a double blessing. The Messiah is coming. And by the way, the son you've been asking God for these some 45, 50 years, you get him too. Only he's not going to be the son, uh, 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 just the son, you know, the, that takes over the family name, not Zach Jr., uh, not the, the boy you're going to take out to ball games. Now, th this son that you waited for so long is going to be incredibly special in God's kingdom. He'll prepare the way for the coming Messiah. Listen to what Zachariah speaks prophetically over his little newborn son. And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you'll prepare the way for the Lord. You'll tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. And because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break on us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to give us the path of peace. See, Jesus would say later in his ministry that there's been no one born of men greater than John the son of Zachariah and Elizabeth, John the Baptist. He's known by in the scriptures. Now, that is quite a compliment. So I found in my own life, I found it's better to do it sooner than later, to stop pressing, stop pushing, stop forcing things to work, stop worrying. Let go of what you're really praying for and just give it to God. You release it to him. It's a prayer of release. And you focus on God's greater plans and purposes for your life. It's not giving up. No, hear me wrong. It's not giving in. It's not quitting. It's just putting your desires back into God's hands, who gave you those desires probably in the first place, who made you a promise. You give it to him. You release it to him. Now, folks, there's great danger in not releasing our dreams to God when we get tired of waiting on him. And what, we, what do we usually do? We jump in and take matters into our own hands. How's that ever worked for you? I tell you, it's always been misery and disaster for me. Abram was uh, 75 years old and God promised him a son. And, and through him, all the nations of the world would be blessed. And that his descendants would outnumber the grains of sand in the sea. His son, Isaac, was born 25 years later. But in between that time, Abram got tired of waiting, fed up with God's sense of time. And his wife, Sarah, decided to help out God, and Abraham agreed and went uh, and had sexual relations with Sarah's servant. Hagar was her name, and they had a child. Remember what they named that child? Ishmael, who was the father of the Arab people, who as a race has been a thorn and enemy in the Jewish side ever since the beginning. We're seeing right now the Mideast exploding in this war between the son of the promise Isaac, and the son of man's way, 
Ishmael. How many times have we pulled that? I, I was only trying to help God, right? Like God needs our help. So we need to release our expectations to God and exchange them for God's bigger picture. That's how we wait. Here's the third thing about waiting in God, and that is rest in God's timing. The Bible calls it waiting on the Lord. Psalm 27, verse 14 says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, wait on the Lord. Now, again, those of us who live in the 21st century, we have lost the art of waiting. Uh, We run frenzied, hurried lives, and God just doesn't operate like that, people. He's not the author of chaos and confusion. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Does that describe you? Does that describe your hurried, frenzied life? And he says, I will give you rest. Folks, we need to learn the rhythm of God's grace, how to rest in his timing. Uh, If you're with us and you weren't, but you're invited, our Wednesday night Bible studies on Zoom. Uh, We were in Hebrews 4 uh, yesterday, and it was focused on the rest of God. That we give our hearts and lives to Jesus Christ, we enter into the rest of God. Boy, that's that's just a neat invitation. Now, so say this after me, right? Repeat after me. God is never early. Go ahead. God is never early. God is never late. Go ahead, say it. God is never late. Say this one. God is always on time. God is always on time. And if that's true, why don't we live like we believe that? Take Jesus' birth. Would we have chosen that time? No mass communication, no social media, no no TV, internet, YouTube. But in Galatians chapter 4, 4, the Holy Spirit inspired Paul. And he writes, but when the right time came, God sent his son into the world. When the right time came. Some versions say in the fullness of time. In other words, perfect timing. God's timing is perfect. Now, resting waiting in the Lord. Here's where we often miss it. Waiting is not passive. It's not just kicking back, chilling, laying out in your hammock and waiting to see what God will do. Waiting doesn't mean doing nothing. It's not fatalistic resignation. It means going about our assigned tasks, confident that God will provide the meaning and the conclusions of our prayers, right? It means a confident, alert expectation that God will do what he said he'll do. Waiting on the Lord is what God has assigned us to do here and now. And we do it wholeheartedly to the Lord. So when God didn't give Zachary and Elizabeth a child right away, they continued serving the Lord. They ministered to the people. Their waiting was not passive. They were highly respected and loved. I bet they were like the the, uh, grandparents of the neighborhood. I bet they would drop by the little kids to their house, to Zach, Ryan, and Elizabeth. And they did this for decades and years, far beyond the age of having their own child. But they didn't just sit back, arms crossed, pouting, waiting for God to do something. Listen, when things really get bad and the waiting is unbearable, just keep on keeping on. Keep on doing your daily devotions. Keep on praying. Keep on serving. Keep on worshiping. Keep on giving. Keep on doing the things God has revealed to you already. Stay on your assignment from God. I know people who, when God disappoints them, when they have to wait, they just throw in the towel. They stop coming to church. They stop praying. They stop growing. All right, here's number four. Fourth lesson. Realize that God has a specific plan for you. When you're waiting on God, you might not see it, but in God's time, you will. I'll bet the first thing Zachariah did when the angel said, you're going to have a son and he's going to prepare the way of the Messiah for whom you've longed for and prayed for all these years. I think Zachariah just bopped his head and said, oi, I can't believe I doubt it. How could have I missed it all these years that God was working behind the scenes for this moment in time? I mean, just knowing that would have actually cause them to enjoy these years even more, right? Listen, you may be at the end of your rope waiting for God, but know this, God is at work in you and in that circumstances, so embrace the wait. God's at work. He's doing something really awesome for you, for the kingdom of God. And if you read this account again, you'll see Zachariah answers to the angel 
was one of doubt. He said, how can that be? I don't have a child. I'm too old to have a child. And Gabriel, the angel, says to Zachariah, you're not going to be able to talk for nine months. <laughs> now, that's a horrific punishment for a priest, a preacher, or a teacher. You know, talking is our business. It's our life. But I think Gabriel shut Zachariah's mouth so he couldn't talk himself out of this miracle with his unbelief. Have you ever done that? Clear as day, God put it in your heart and mind to do something, to to. to to answer his call, but then you talk yourself out of it. Who am I? I'm not trained. I, I'm too old. I'm too young. I don't have a degree. I don't have the money. Gabriel shut Gay, uh, Zachariah's mouth. So this promise of God would gestate in his spirit, just like that little baby would grow in Elizabeth's womb. I mean, God loves when we trust him, when we put our faith on the line, counting on him, that just pleases God beyond measure. And likewise, our doubts and our unbelief easily grieve his heart. Well, here's the fifth and last thing we've learned from the waiting of Zachary and Elizabeth. We need to recognize God's answer. That means we need to be searching the horizon for God's spirit moving in our midst. Psalm 135, verses 5 through 6. Read it with me. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchmen wait for the morning. Now, in biblical times, watchmen diligently guarded the city. They walked around the, the walls, the gated walls of the city. They watched for enemies who might attack at night. They waited for the sun to rise. They were alert. They were obedient. They were uh, ready to, to, to fight if needed to be fight. They couldn't speed up the process. A watchman knew the difference between his job and God's job. So we need to be watchmen. For God's answers. Why? Because his answers are usually so different than our expectations. If we're not watchful, we'll miss it. Zechariah was stunned by God's answer. So stunned, he almost didn't receive it. He couldn't receive it through unbelief. Listen, so many moves of God have gone unnoticed by the very same people who prayed for God to move and touch this generation, especially in us mainline folks who have this church thing down to a science. I heard someone say we could do church and the Holy Spirit wouldn't even have to be there and we wouldn't know it. Listen, God is stirring in so many areas. It wasn't that long ago we were watching the Asbury Revival, the revival among the colleges. Uh, you know, just one of the things that's been given birth over the past uh, 20, uh, 30 some years is, is uh, the renewal of, of worship. I know people call it contemporary worship. It's a renewal of worship. I think, you know, looking back when I was a teenager, uh, the only great Christian radio station we had with some hillbilly from the mountains preaching damnation and brimstone. If you wanted some Christian music that had any kind of beat, well, kumbaya, and they'll know we're Christians by our love was the best there was. But now you look, and there is just a, 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 a multitude of radio stations and YouTubes and Spotify, music that's reaching this culture for Christ and our world, this generation, worship bands. They're popular with youth of all ages, and they sing songs of praise and worship the God. It's worldwide. At the same time, there's still churches and Christians who wrestle whether they should even have con contemporary service or, or sing contemporary music. People say, over my dead body. Oh, wait a minute. You, you just prayed that God would do something great in this generation to reach your kids and your grandchildren, and he is, but he didn't do it the way you wanted to? You don't like the music because it's not in the hymnal that was published decades, centuries ago. Someday, collectively, I think the church will only see white-haired people in the pews and they'll bop their head and say, Oi, how did we miss it? I'll tell you how. We were looking for God to do something we understand, something we plan, something we like, something that doesn't rock our boat or bring change. God gave Zachariah nine months of silence so he could wrap his brain around God's answer. His very own son would lead the way to the Messiah of Israel. Sometimes we need to close our mouths and stop criticizing what God is doing in this generation and wrap our brain around it and get on board. I want to be where God's moving. 
I want to embrace what God is doing. I want to partner with God. I want to be right in the current of the rushing waters of revival and renewal of people's lives and communities and nations. And by the way, Zachariah got it down. He learned his lesson. When the nine months ended and the baby was born, he did exactly what Gabriel told him to do. Name your son John. He didn't know quite know why, but he learned in those nine months simply to trust God and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. And we just have to, again, listen to what Zechariah prophetically, as the Holy Spirit gave him the words, spoke over his son, his destiny. And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you'll prepare the way of the Lord. You'll tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins because God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven, is about to break on us to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide us in the path of peace. And then read this, the verse, I highlighted it because this is who John became. John grew up and became strong in spirit. He lived in the wilderness until his public ministry to Israel. People, it is worth waiting on the Lord. There's great reward. Hold on. Persevere in prayer. Rest in God's promises. Recognize God's answers. Release those things to God's hands. Trust in his timing. Amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you took notes because if you're not waiting on God for something now, you will be. And you may have friends and family who are waiting, waiting for God to answer that prayer of salvation for a loved one, maybe uh, to, to deliver someone from the bondage of addiction. Uh, maybe it's a health crisis and, and you're waiting for God to do a miracle. Wait on God. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know there's many people watching now who are waiting on you and it's gotten wearisome. We're tired, Lord. It's It takes energy. It takes strength to persevere. And yet you tell us it'll be worth it. Father, we release those prayers to you and we pray for your bigger purpose, your biggest will in, in our lives. And Lord, we just know that, that you are at work and that gives us peace in our hearts. Peace, knowing that you hear our prayers and you answer our prayers in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Well, listen, again, check out our website, herefordumc.com. Find out our Christmas uh, schedules. Uh, come be a part of what we're doing. And uh, God bless you wherever you are. Be the hands and feet of Christ in your neighborhood, in your community, where you work, where you shop. And the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you next time.